Once in a hole there lived a hobbit. <laughs> the opening words of the book The Hobbit. Do you ever wonder where he got that word from? Hobbit. Where'd that concept come from? Today we're talking about see it, make it, have it. See it, make it, have it. How do you see something? Well, you just start where you are. And sometimes the most playful, childlike consciousness is the most powerful. Sometimes the most playful, childlike consciousness is the most creative. See it, make it, have it. J.R.R. Tolkien was a young scholar, and he was a professor at Cambridge, and he had to write a lot of uh, articles and journals, and one of the things that he wrote about was uh, um, linguistics, because he was a linguist, and he also talked about mythology, because he was primarily a Norse linguist, and he talked about where did they get all these Norse gods and tales and all these things. So his article is about where does mythology come from? Where do these great stories come from? And he said, they come from anywhere. Somebody just had an idea. They just saw it. They just came out with it. And he said, for instance, you could take a nonsense word, hobbit. And he said, you could write a nonsense sentence. Once in a hole there lived a hobbit. And out of that could come a whole mythology. And he went and wrote the rest of the article. And then he went home. He turned it in. And he thought, well, maybe I could do something with this. <laughs> That's how it happened. But I want to create something in my life. I want something profound. I want it to be deep. <laughs> hobbit. Once in a hole, there lived a hobbit. Yeah, okay. Playful, playful, playful attitude. Just take it. The most playful... Creative acts are the ones that are the most creative. Is God at play in the universe? Is God the play of the universe? In the beginning, God. That's how Genesis starts. And, and I think we need to take a playful attitude with Genesis because it isn't... I got in trouble in a church once. My very first Sunday, I was... I was going to give a talk, and I, I was going to quote Genesis, and I thought I had a funny line to say, so I, 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 that week, that state board of education had outlawed the teaching of evolution, which got overturned later, but uh, in the high schools, and so I thought I'd have some fun. I'd say, well, you know, I'm going to read from the book of Genesis, which despite the Kansas State Board of Education is not a science textbook. <laughs> oh. <laughs> People got up and walked out, I got letters, I got all kinds of phone calls. But we have a playful attitude. We don't take the Bible literally, neither do the Catholics or the Methodists or the Episcopalians and most other Christians and the Orthodox people in, in, in Greece and Russia. But we've got to understand that this creative act is something more than can be concretized, can be created into a box, put into a box by human beings. And it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light, and God saw the light was good. And so, what is this creative act, this light? Well, light is a heightened vibration, a heightened vibration that brings things into being. A heightened vibration. So you want to create something? You speak the word, you visualize light. These are all little hints on how we can do that. How about John, the book of John? Very similar. In the beginning, it starts. The Word already was. And that Word was with God and was God, existing in the beginning with God. God created everything through the Word. Nothing was created except through it. This Word gave life to everything that was created. That life brought light to everyone. That light shines in the darkness and the darkness could never grasp it. Literally meant grasp hold of it. Which could mean doesn't understand it. Can't crush it. You can't defeat it, extinguish it. The light is the only real thing. Okay, so we're trying to create. So what's your intention? See it, make it happen. Remember what um, Eric Butterworth said? He said, don't set it right, see it right. Be in that consciousness of creativity. It's a playful consciousness. It's letting go. You say, well, how do I do that? Have a playful attitude, a letting go attitude. That's why we did that this morning. Think of all the people in the room, all the good intentions, all the good lights. Think we're all lights in this room. Everyone in this room has light. And it's, 
it's exponentially because of our alignment with each other. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. That energy is building, building, building. And so we can take the meditation we just did, the meditation we're going to do at the end, and then build upon it. So what's your, what's your pebble? What's your seed? It's time for seed planting, is it not? And what do we do with the seed? Well, you've got some seeds. You're going to be planting them probably. And you're going to place them in the soil and cover it over. And you're, going to, and you're not going to make a big deal out of it. You're just going to plant the seed. It's a playful attitude. It's a joy-filled attitude. It's a light-hearted attitude. And it's one that doesn't try to make a big significant deal out of it. In the beginning was the Word. The Word, I think I've shared, is, is 2,500 years old. It means a fiery, invisible vapor that pervades the entire universe and governs all rational change and is capable of consciousness. That's what it meant. Wow, that's what it meant. And it was chosen as the definition of the Christ by the author of John. So that Christ power, that Christ presence is that power within. And it is something that we can rely on. I, I'm in a movie. I'm in a movie called What is New Thought? And about 25 people have been interviewed for the movie. We're going to show it in July. It just came out last year. I was interviewed for it. But one person interviewed for it had an incredible story. Her name is Della Reese. She's the person in Touched by an Angel, right? And she also has a church, you know. It's called the Up Church. It's a New Thought Church. teaches what we believe in, in Los Angeles. This is her philosophy. And she said, this before she was a minister, in 1979, she was on the Johnny Carson show, and she had an embolism pop. She had a massive stroke. She said that the doctors told her later that she should have been dead before she hit the floor, and she wasn't. She said, from that, I surmise that Maybe there was a purpose for me sticking around. The doctors told me why I wasn't going to get better, why I was going to die after I came to, after two days. And I thought, with all their education, with all their knowledge and all their background, they don't know what my future is. They have no say in it. I know that the Christ in me, the God power in me, is doing the healing work. And if I have a work to do, I will be healed. And she was, and she is totally fine. She set an intention. And out of that, she became a minister. I've shared that I'm a minister because of my sister's healing when she was born with birth defects. Other people have hit bottom. They set an intention. They've gone on to do great things. What is the intention? And you say, well, I've got a certain intention in mind. I think I know what it is. Are you sure? Ask. Remember years ago, I was teaching a class on treasure mapping, which is visual prayer. We take pieces of uh, pictures of magazines of different things, and we glue them on a poster board, and we write things, affirmations, and things like that. And, and I had my, my two or three of them, you know, and I was doing it along with the class. And I kept finding these pictures. I've shared this before of, a, of the Jaguar, the car, not the animal. The, 1986, it was, the Jaguar. And they were so beautiful that year. They were works of art. They were works of sculpture, which they needed to be because they would break down and you would never be able to write <laughs> I didn't know that at the time, but I, I put them, this is when they were made by British Leyland. And so I, I put them on the thing. And I wasn't, I didn't really didn't need a car. I didn't want a car, but they were so beautiful. I just kept finding them. And, Put it, and I put it away. Six months later, I'm working out. The guy next to me, I, I, what do you do for a living? I'm a minister. What do you do for a living? I'm a purveyor of rare British sports cars. I said, really? I said, well, you know, it's so funny because I uh, had, had thought about it. I didn't tell him about the treasure map, but uh, about a six-cylinder stick shift Jaguar. Well, what I haven't said is that they were illegal in the United States. They weren't imported because of smog control. They only sent the automatics, and I didn't want an automatic. And he said, I've got one. I said, you can't have one. They're not legal. He says, well, there's only one that exists in the entire United States. Now, I drew the one guy in the entire United States had had one out of a playful intention that wasn't even an intention, probably because I had a playful attitude. And I said, well, well I can't drive it. It's not legal. He says, oh, I know somebody who will retrofit it. It'll be street legal. I said, well, really? He says, yeah, Sylvester Stallone owns it. He drives it around on his ranch. I said, well, why doesn't he retrofit it? He says, oh, he has enough cars. He just wants to get rid of this one. And I thought, wow. 
and it was like $13,000. It was really reasonable. It was a beautiful car. And then I went to Consumer Reports and found out that it was the least reliable car in the world. <laughs> <laughs> now, if it works for something as garbagey as that, uh. I let go of it. Be careful for what you ask for. But you know, think how much more powerful it would be if you let the goal be set through you. Let the goal be set through you. Be open. Be receptive. So I'm going to Beverly Hale Watson, and she was meditating, and one day, she was in her late 60s, she was, uh, she just got, that she needed to volunteer as a Sunday school teacher in her local Unity Church. She didn't even attend that church. And uh, she, okay. So she went and she started doing that, and in doing so, she, they didn't have any Sunday school material, because there were many years there we just didn't have any in Unity. Diane Benzera had not started creating hers. So she said, well, I'll start writing it. She started writing it and practicing it on the kids and trying it out. She hadn't been around kids for years, so she really got to kind of road test it with the kids. And after she got several weeks of lessons, it was send them out to Unity Churches free of charge, but don't tell headquarters about it. <laughs> okay, so she sent them out. And she called, I remember her calling me up and saying, or maybe I got it in the mail, I don't know, but I talked to her on the phone. She said, yeah, it's just free of charge. They're all yours. And then churches started tithing to her, and she started sending out more and more and more and more. And then Diane came into the equation, and she didn't need to do it anymore, because Diane is doing it all over the country. But what was that about? Once in a hole, there lived a hobbit. It came to her. What's that about? How did I marry Lynn? I've shared that story a million times. I just had this dream about this person. I didn't even know her name. or thought her name was Mickey. <laughs> That was her nickname, but I didn't know that. And then she showed up at my church about two months later, in the back of the room, with her then boyfriend. <laughs> he didn't know she'd already decided to break up with him. But anyway, I just talked to her. I didn't, you know, whatever. But nothing, you know. And then that summer was the minister's conference, and then she comes downstairs with my friend. And, and then he leaves, and then we're just talking and talking, and she needs a ride home. We talk, and we pray together, and nothing, you know, whatever. And, and then... You know, there's nothing romantic at all. She writes me a letter, and I didn't answer it for uh, five months. <laughs> then I answer it, and then she writes me back, and then oh, I'm carrying around that letter, and I just it, it was nothing romantic. It was just a, 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 you know, a lot of spiritual stuff, and I'm, I just and I finally and I went into prayer. Why am I carrying around this letter with me? It's because you're going to marry her. <laughs> I thought I was out of my mind. I went to my sister, I said, I think I'm crazy. She says, you're crazy. That's crazy. But I went to my mentor. My mentor said, no, I feel that you're, it's right. You're going to marry her. What? And it took me like two months, a month and a half before I even dared talk about anything personal. And the rest, as they say, is history. So what is that? What is that? There's a lot more to the story, but that's the short story. It's like, it came through me. It came through me. Jane Elizabeth Hart, who's going to be speaking here in June, was an executive at Unity School, and she was sitting in the Silent Unity prayer meeting, and she saw an eight-sided figure with the word Center for Enlightenment. Again, it's see it. She didn't know what it meant. She didn't know what it meant. She started driving around looking for a place called the Center for Enlightenment. There wasn't any. And what came to her was, you're going to create it. Oh, my goodness. Well, she had two months savings. She was past retirement age, but she had a wonderful executive job at Unity. It was incredible. And she decided, she knew, she was guided to let it go. With two months savings, her kids went crazy. Mom! <laughs> you always do stuff like this. Yeah, I'm always taking care of it. Am I not? Yes, but still, you don't do this. I'm going to do it. Okay. You, I, we knew you wouldn't listen to us. <laughs> two months later, less than two months later, somebody had tracked her down. They actually had a hunt for her to lay on her the funds that eventually grew into like seven figures. She did the Center for Enlightenment. But here, you've got the see it, then the make it, which is the process you go through, and then the habit. You've got to let go of the habit because she didn't know what it was supposed to be. And she established it in, in one location, then another location, then another location, then another location, and now it's on the web. It's not a location anymore. Oh my goodness. Because she had to let go of the pictures. I am willing to let go of my limited pictures of my good. Together, I am willing to let go of my limited pictures of my good. Now I said, see it. You say, well, how can I see something? I don't know what it's going to be. You see the seed. You see the pebble. But you let go of where it's going to show up, how it's going to show up. And 
You're open. You're open. You're open. 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 See it. Make it. See it. Make it. Have it. Well, what's the make it part? Well, strangely enough, the making it includes letting go of anything that's blocking us. There was a man in my congregation who I didn't know had set an intention to make major transformations in his life. I didn't know this because I hardly got close to him at all because every time he walked up to Lynn and I during fellowship time, he unloaded. I mean, he was really an angry guy and he would say really mean things and we'd go, oh, here he comes. <laughs> Honestly, and it wasn't connected to anything. Why is this guy so angry? And then one day he walked up to me. He had decided that he was going to let go and he was going to make a move in his life and it came through him. He actually was listening to the talks even though I had no idea. And he handed me the sheaf of papers and I read it. It was about being molested as a child by a Boy Scout um, Scoutmaster. And uh, he, he walked up to me the next week and said, did you read it? I said, yes. He says, the guy looked just like you. Oh, That's oh. what happened. He was letting go of it. And he did the forgiveness work. I shared with him the seven steps. He worked, and that was a church where Jane and Elizabeth Hart was. And he was able to work with the seven steps and release it. And his life opened up and blossomed. We became really good friends. We'd go out to lunch. We had a great time. Never had any problems. What's this about? Moving past the seeming limitations and the block. The blocks. Deepak Chopra said something wonderful. I just read this last week. He said, if you think you have a problem, don't focus on the problem. Don't even look for a solution. Instead, focus on your expanded awareness. Expanded awareness? How am I going to solve a problem with that? Because in the expanded awareness, as Jesus said, seek first the kingdom, all the things will be added unto you. The needs will be fulfilled. Everything you need, but then you've got to let go of the picture of what you thought it was going to be. You don't know what the highest good is, but you do know that the highest good is there, and you've got to let it go. Today, we are going to be welcoming our chaplains. Our chaplains, nurtured with so much love by Betsy for over 10 years, and so much love is generated in this consciousness and has been. These chaplains set an intention, and you know, and we're human beings, I'll bet some chaplains said, I'm going to be a chaplain so I can be spiritual. <laughs> I can be spiritual and be more spiritual. And I can look a certain way. I mean, it's normal. But Betsy told them, the thing that's going to happen is that everything that you need to look at will come up for you. Everything will come up for you for you to let it go. Your stuff will come up and come right there for you to let it go. That's What do you think marriage is? <laughs> oh, and so I can have somebody in my life who tells me I'm wonderful and makes me comfortable all the time. <laughs> you think I didn't think that? Oh, then what is it really? It is an opportunity to grow and to love, which means letting go of your pictures of what things are supposed to look like and moving into something new and now and beyond the pairs of opposites of likes, dislikes, goods, bads, ups, downs, and moving into something that's unconditional. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about setting an attention. I'm talking about making it happen, which not isn't forcing it to happen. Your prayers need to be moved from the level of more is more is more is more to a level of quality, moving from quantity to quality. If I say to you, that you should paint, that you're going to paint. Some of you in this room are going to think, oh, he means paint a house. And when you're painting a house, more is more. The more you paint, the more you've done. It's, and you know what? There's some place for that. Others of you are going to go, oh, he's talking about painting a canvas. With a canvas, more is more. You've got to know when to stop. You're painting. There's a quality. So your prayers are no longer about getting more, getting more, getting more, forcing, forcing, forcing. Will, personal will, Ego prayers, mind prayers, head prayers, and moving to heart prayers, soul prayers, surrender prayers, where you know when to put down the brush. I remember in 1978 when I drove Norman Vincent Peale around to Kansas City, I was his chauffeur, he told me this story about this guy who wandered into his office in a total agitation saying, I gotta talk to Norman, I gotta talk to Norman. And he just burst into his office, even though his receptionist was saying, well, he's busy. He went in there and he says, Norman, I need to talk to you. My life is, my problems have got problems. I got so much upset in my life. And I want you to tell me what I should do about it, but don't give me any of that God stuff or any of that religious stuff because I don't want to hear about it. I've had enough of it. And Peel said, well, I don't know if I have anything else to offer. I mean, that's that's the where the solution's going to be found is... And he said, oh, you're just like all the other ones that stormed out. 
Peel said, I, I shot him an arrow prayer. An arrow prayer. He just shot him an arrow prayer. He never explained what that was. He just shot him an arrow prayer. An hour later, this guy shows up again. I gotta talk to Norman. I gotta talk to Norman. They, they, they try, you know, say, what is it? He says, what did you do to me? <laughs> what did you do? He says, I don't know. I just said a prayer. I don't know. He says, well, I was standing on the corner of 5th Avenue and 42nd Street, and all of a sudden everybody started glowing. And I started feeling this feeling everybody was basically good inside. And I, I, I know my problems aren't all solved, but I, I, I have a sense of well-being, and I feel like everything's going to be all. What did you do to me? And he said, well, I didn't do anything. It's that thing you didn't want to talk about. <laughs> As Deepak Chopra says, it's not focusing on the problem, trying to find the solution, it's expanding the awareness. And so this guy, every time, and he never went to Peel's church, but any time Peel had somebody that was right up against it and wasn't open to anything spiritual, he'd bring this guy in to talk to him. So in your life, where can you let it go? Where can you say the prayer? Let it go. Move from that literal prayer that I'm going to get what I want and make more and more and more, but just let it go. A little pebble, seed, oh, let it come up. Your job is to fertilize water, take care of it, but then let go of the fruits. Let it be what it is. So we've got our chaplains to, to bless, so we're going to go right into prayer now. And, and, and you've already done the pebble, you've already done the planting, so you don't have to do that again. Okay? But what we're going to do is bask in the awareness and add our divine energy and love. We're going to nurture that seed that we planted. We're going to feel the awareness of the rippling waters coming out in concentric circles. We're going to just feel the well-being, the all is well, that comes when we let something go. I loose it, I let it go, I release it. I free it. Once in a hole there lived a hobbit, I can have a playful attitude. I don't have to know how it's done. I can just be open. And God, where I haven't been aware of what my intention is, open my heart, my mind, my heart mind. Give me the awareness and give me the willingness to go through whatever process is necessary of letting go, forgiving, and sticking with it. And help me to let go of the fruits, the results. And so it is. Amen. Intention is a powerful thing. And we're going to be working on Tuesday night, the class is one more week of being open on intentions the next two Tuesday nights. So we're really going to go deep with this intention, this seed planting bit. And so come if you will. It's a great opportunity. Read about it in your bulletins. But sticking with, sticking with that which you're working on, that's the important thing. As we um, prepare for our offering, I just want to share with you Somebody shared with me that a bee cannot get honey if it buzzes around the flower, it has to land on it. It has to land on it. And so set your intention, be willing to put yourself out. And know that if your intention isn't the highest one, it'll change. And in the beginning was the word, the word, the expression of God. Genesis, it says, God created the heavens and the earth. God said, let there be light. That word, that speaking forth, is our intention. And sometimes it's best to do it in a very playful and childlike way. Sometimes it's best to let our adult rational mind take a rest, take a vacation, and come out and play. I find the most playful prayers and intentions are those that succeed the most without any artifice, without any theology, without any intellect. We just play in the fields 
of God of the fields of the universe. So imagine with me a visualization that is so simple. Just imagine there's a door that says intentions. And you open it and you walk in and there's an elevator. And there's only an up button and you push it and the elevator doors open. And you ride the elevator up after you push the button that says intentions. It goes up, up, up. You feel yourself getting lighter as it goes up. And when it opens up, it's in a room. You walk out into a room that you to design, decorate, populate with whatever you want. Except for there's a chair in the middle of it. Again, it's your chair. It's the one that fits you. So imagine, what does this room look like? The light is streaming in. The light is shining. The light is coming in through all these openings. Look around. See what it's like. This is your intentions room. And there's the chair, and it's your intentions chair. And you go and you sit in it. And in this childlike wonder, in this playful place, you sit in the chair, you close your eyes, and you have two visualizations that are so simple. You ask first, what is my intention? What is the intention of my heart? And then you let go of any intentions that you brought into the room with you. You ask, what is my intention? And you take the first one that comes up. Have an open heart to grow spiritually, to love, to experience healing, whatever it is. What is that intention? And take that first thing and if you nothing comes, just make your intention to find out what your intention is. And now imagine as you're sitting in this chair with your eyes closed, that you're taking this intention as a seed and planting it deep into some wonderful soil and covering it over and watering it and sprinkling fertilizer and blessing it letting it go. That's your first visualization. Feels good, doesn't it? And now, I try a second visualization. Imagine your intention as a pebble and you're facing with your eyes closed, visualizing this now. That in your visualization, you're facing a body of water that has no ripples. It's perfectly still. <coughs> and perfectly reflects that which is above. The sky, it's like mirror, it's like glass. Throw the pebble and plop, and then out go the ripples, and the ripples go on. Ripples of good. You can let it go because the ripples have their own law, their own intelligence. And now just let it go and dwell in the silence of possibility and how good it feels. Thank you, God, for the ripples. Thank you, God, for the growth. Thank you that we can let it go. And thank you that we just let the whole scene dissolve. We know we can come back to our intentions room anytime. But we just let the whole thing dissolve, filled with a sense of well-being and anticipation of good, of release and letting go. We say, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. And so it is. Amen.